So thank you everyone for coming this morning. Uh, my name is Aisha Dixon. I'm the director of the Ameritai Retirees Relations Center. Um, we are your campus liaison for all things um, to advocate for you and your retirement, to help you live well, be healthy, and plan activities and programs. Um, we've been working remotely since March and we're doing um, as much as we can to bring you interesting and exciting um, and educational presentations. Um, today is a really a fantastic one. I've known Monica in many different facets for many years and um, also Ishara Ballas is our uh, 50 plus program manager. She helped coordinate this program with Maria who is with the ERRC. So thank you to um, Ishara and Maria for coordinating this program. Uh, Monica Moore is a community health program manager for the Mary S. Easton Center for Alzheimer's and the co-director for training and education activities for the UCLA California Alzheimer's Disease Center. She has worked in the field of aging for 20 plus years, focusing on community education, outreach, and caregiver support. She has her master's degree in gerontology from the California State Long Beach and gerontology from Sonoma State University. So with that said, again, thank you, Monica. Um, I listed you as a co-host, so you can go ahead and begin. Awesome, great. Good, uh, let me get this going here first before I actually try to talk and do this at the same time. Okay, um, good morning to everybody. Um, thank you very much for being here, for sharing, um, for spending some of your morning with me. Um, oops, at the beginning, sorry. There we go. Okay, now we're at the beginning of the presentation. All right. Um, and so th thank you very much, of course, to Ishara, who I work very closely with in many, 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 many different um, capacities. Always a pleasure. Uh, Maria and Aisha, thank you very much for having me um, be here um, to present to your um, Ameritime retirees. I'm very happy to be able to do that. So um, we are with, I am with the Easton Center. So we are um, in normal world. We would be in uh, the Reed building right across um, the way from the medical center. Um, obviously, um, we have not, I personally have not been there since March. So I say I stopped off once to pick up some snacks out of my drawer because I didn't want those to go bad since I'm not going back for a long time. So I wanted to make sure that I brought home my snacks. But other than that, we have been working remotely. All of our programs have gone virtual. Um, and so just briefly, some of the things that the Easton Center does is we obviously um, do community education such as this, um, and we have a very robust research program where we have our, the people in their labs trying to figure out Alzheimer's disease, trying to find medications that could work for Alzheimer's, and really doing some of that very um, basic science Alzheimer's research. We also have a very strong clinical trials program um, that is now back up and running after a little bit of a pause for um, due to COVID at the beginning, but we're up and running again. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of those trials just in terms of how they connect with um, living a brain healthy lifestyle and things that we could do. Um, and then also finally, we have our neurology clinic where we have neurologists who will see patients for Alzheimer's disease, help with proper diagnosis, either of dementia, mild cognitive impairment, or if it needs to be more of a specific type of dementia, um, you know, dementia with Lewy bodies, frontal temporal dementia. So we have these specialists who are there to be able to provide the, that proper diagnosis. That's one thing that we hear a lot is people will go to their neurologist and it'll be a general diagnosis of probable dementia. So we want to make sure that people get diagnosed properly. So these are the things that the Easton Center does. Uh, we are, of course, here a resource for all of you. If anyone has questions regarding Alzheimer's or dementia um, or you know, brain health, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I know I will, my information is at the end of this presentation and I'm happy to be able to answer any questions that you may have. So please put them in the chat. Um, if this was an in-person talk, we would be doing questions throughout because I like that interaction. Um, but when we do things via Zoom, it's a little bit easier if I talk for a bit and then, you know, we engage with questions at the end. 
um, again, trying to figure out the things that work best for everybody. But please write your questions in the chat, which is down at the bottom of your screen. Um, there's a little, um, if you hover your mouse over, over at the bottom, it has a little chat feature. So um, type in your questions and I'd be happy to do the best I can to answer them. If I can't answer, I'll either make up the answer or actually connect you with somebody who um, knows the answer or get it for you. Um, so let's get started on this presentation. Um, so uh, some of the things we're going to talk about, just my basic outline here, talk about possible causes of memory loss. Um, always very briefly, I touch on what is dementia. Um, this is a question that we get no matter what. Uh, my presentation topic is, so I always want to make sure that I do mention it. Um, talk about the heart and brain connection and see how uh, that what we how we take care of our heart really does affect our brain. Um, and then also looking at research on risk reduction. Um, this is going to be the bulk of the presentation is um, where is research going in terms of risk reduction, how we can keep our brains healthy, and how can we can try to push off dementia as long as possible, if not prevent it altogether. So as we age, of course, our, we are going to slow down a little bit. Um, our bodies slow down a little bit. Um, and with that is also our brain. Um, as I always say, you know, I'm sure most of you cannot run as fast as a five-year-old. Um, but I'm also sure that you don't even want to run as fast as a five-year-old. You don't expect to. Um, so why do we expect um, our brains to work as well as they always have? We expect those to be just as sharp as it has always been, um, yet your brain is just as old as the rest of you. So if you have some aches and pains in your knees and in your hips and in your hands, well, you might have some of those in your brain as well. And that's just normal because of its basic aging. So when we look at the possible causes of memory loss, obviously age is going to be your greatest um, risk factor for um, memory loss. And it's also just the way that your brain thinks. Um, it's the way that you um, process information, the way that you absorb information. So it's not just when we think about memory in terms of recall, it's everything that our brains control. And so that is going to be affected as we age. Um, I just know that say personally, I used to be able to read a book and listen to music at the same time. Um, I can't do that at all now. Because if so, I'll be listening to, I'll be reading and my eyes will be going down the pages, but then I'll be listening to the music. And the next thing I know, I'm halfway down a page and I have no clue what I just read because I shifted more to thinking about the music, not so much focusing on the words of the book. So things like that are normal. It's just, we have a harder time focusing our attention as we age. So that is gonna be one possible cause of memory loss. Um, another one is medication side effects. Um, as we age, we are most likely on more, more, more medications and those do have an effect on your memory. It all depends, you know, what is the medication for? Um, is it a new medication? Is it an old medication? Is it a medication that you have continually just renewed, you know, and you haven't really had it adjusted in a number of years? Well, as we age, our brains change, our bodies change, our metabolism changes, and the effectiveness and the efficiency of some medication also changes. So um, that is, I would say, probably one of the top causes of what we would call a reversible memory loss, um, where that can be fixed. Like my husband's grandmother, had, um, she was living in Florida by herself and started experiencing some significant memory problems. And so the family got gathered together, you know, pulled her, brought her up to be with the family. And, you know, they looked at, her, they brought her to the doctor who reevaluated all of her medications. And you think about all the different things that were happening to her at that life, at that time of life. Her husband, of you know probably 50 years 60 years had just had recently passed away she was isolated she was depressed she was having problems sleeping and she was taking different medications um it's like oh i've got this in the cabinet this will help me sleep and oh i've got this and this can help me um, but ultimately that interaction between those medications was so great that it was having problem it was having an effect on her co cognitive ability so they brought her to the doctor who reevaluated all of her medications from her heart medicine to medications for sleep, balanced them out, 
And then ultimately she was fine afterwards. She lived probably another 12 years um, and she passed away at the age of 98, cognitively intact. So from a few years where we were very concerned about her cognitive ability and thinking it might be the beginning of Alzheimer's or dementia, it ultimately was just a medication interaction. So that's one of the first things that will always be looked at by a quality clinician. Other possible causes of memory loss, of course, depression. Um, you know, if you're depressed, you're not going to be thinking properly. Uh, poor nutrition, severe dehydration, um, which again, as we age, it's harder for our bodies to sort of signal to us that we are thirsty. So people will say, well, you know, I'm not really thirsty, so I haven't had much to drink. Um, and then that over an extended period of time can lead to severe dehydration, um, which could again cause a reversible uh, memory loss. And then of course, thyroid problems. It's something again that people are going to be tested for if they're um, experiencing memory loss that is sudden and uh, they've gone to the doctor for that. That will be something that they are tested for to see if there is a thyroid problem so that they can get that adjusted, taken care of, and then the, um, hopefully the memory loss would not continue. Oh, oops, sorry. Okay, there we go. So when we're thinking about um, Alzheimer's disease, obviously this is the big word that everybody is afraid of and scared of as we age. Um, it obviously is um, a major, it's um, the leading cause of neurodegenerative dementia. So with Alzheimer's disease, we actually see, you know, upon autopsy, a person with Alzheimer's, their brain is actually one third the size of a normal brain. So it actually atrophies and shrinks during the progression of the disease. So that's why it's called a neurodegenerative dementia. Um, currently 5.8 million Americans have Alzheimer's. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and fifth here in California, mainly due to our larger older adult population. Um, and it's the only cause of death in the top 10 that cannot be prevented, cured, or slowed down. So, you know, we think about heart disease, we think about cancers, all of these can be um, either prevented, they can be cured, we can slow them down, give people more, more life, more quality of life. Um, but with Alzheimer's disease, we can't do that. There are medications that are available, but they don't fix the disease. And that's what not some of the stuff that the researchers at the Easton Center are, are working for to try to find a good drugs that can really help change the course of this disease. Um, and as we know, Alzheimer's is also incredibly expensive, you know, $200 billion a year in healthcare costs that are associated uh, with Alzheimer's just in the United States. Um, oh, sorry, getting the hang of this. So when we think about this word of dementia, um, dementia is you know, this word that people often will get confused with, or if, let's say if we were in person right now, I would ask you, you know, who knew the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And I don't ask this to put anyone on the spot. I ask this to try to get an idea and to also bring, you know, idea of what the audience's in, um, knowledge base is, and also to show how so many people think it's something different where often I will hear people say, oh, well, my mom just has dementia. She doesn't have Alzheimer's. That's when they get mean. Um, or it's like, oh, well, it's just a little dementia. Um, and sometimes I think people use the word dementia as it's softer. It's not that big, mean word of Alzheimer's disease, a big so diagnosis like that. But when we think about this word of dementia, it is an, an umbrella term, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And it, you need to have a cognitive decline in a certain area. If you look on the screen, you see those five different areas of thinking, judgment, reasoning, um, memory, and language, along with a functional impairment. So where the thinking might be affecting your ability to take medications, the thinking problems, the cognitive decline of your thinking may be impacting your driving, your paying the bills, personal care. So as I say, we all know people in our life who may have poor judgment, right? You know, just, it's just that person that you know who just has poor judgment. Um, we, know, we all know people who just have bad memories. You know, they always have had a bad memory. It's, it has nothing to do with Alzheimer's or aging. It's just how their brains work. Um, and, or people who have a harder time with um, language. And it's just, that's just how their brain is. So when we're looking at a cognitive decline, we're looking at a 
change from what your individual normal is, which is also another reason why sometimes it's hard to diagnose because my normal is different than Ishara's normal, which is different than Maria's normal. And so we look at our overall uh, um, change in cognitive decline along with a functional impairment. And that's how you get this idea of what is a dementia. Um, it is very important to note that this is not normal. This is not a normal part of aging and you shouldn't think that. And if somebody tells you that, well, then they're wrong and you need to go get a second opinion because it is not a normal part of aging. So what causes this dementia, this problems with the way you're thinking and reasoning? Well, there's a lot of different things. Um, Alzheimer's is the most common form, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and you see underneath this umbrella, all the different types of dementias. And this is only a selection of them. This would probably be the most common form, the, the most, yeah, the most common forms and ones that you're going to hear about the most. So Alzheimer's, the second most common form of dementia is dementia with Lewy bodies and people over the age of 65. Um, frontal temporal lobar degeneration, also known as FTD, is the second most common form of dementia for people under the age of 65. So we see how this really does affect people um, across the ages. Um, and again, when you look at traumatic brain injury or other um, illnesses and other diseases can also cause this cognitive decline that creates dementia type symptoms. So if you have any questions, hold on, let me just, anyone have any questions on that? We good? Let me just, I see my chat. Let me try to help out here. Okay, just want to make sure that we're uh, all good. Okay, oh, yes. I, possibly, uh, is, there, is there like a, a line between not having dementia and having it? Or is it kind yes. of like a continuous gradient? Oh, great, great question. Thank you very much. So um, actually what that line would be called is called mild cognitive impairment, MCI. So mild cognitive impairment is sort of that gray area between dementia and between normal. And some people who experience mild cognitive impairment will go on to develop Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. And some people won't. It could just always be this, it's worse than normal aging. So again, it's not normal, but it's also, it doesn't progress. So there is this area called MCI, mild cognitive impairment, that can be that in between. Um, and also none of this happens overnight. You know, a very few things, the only thing on this page that would happen overnight would be Creutzfeldt Jakob. Um, and that is like the human variant of mad cow. Um, and so that is obviously a very quick, rapid progression, um, obviously aside from like a stroke or traumatic brain injury. But all these others, they're gradual. And they think, um, and this is, I'm gonna talk about this more as we get more into the presentation, talking about this world of what we do now can help our brains later in terms of the health. So if you, let's say, if you're destined to get Alzheimer's disease, you know, because again, there is some genetic component to everything in our lives. Um, maybe if you live this brain healthy lifestyle, this really focus on health, maybe you could push off, keep pushing it down the road, keep kicking that can further and further down the road. So you're not going to be diagnosed at 70. Maybe you'd be diagnosed at 80. So we see how we can sort of some, through lifestyle interventions, we can try to kick this down a little bit more. So let me get move to, um, here we go. When we're talking about the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, um, almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. Um, so that is obviously, it's a big issue for women. We're also thinking about women are most likely to be the caregivers. So Alzheimer's disease really does impact women um, disproportionately than men in many different areas. Um, also, older African Americans are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's or another form of dementia than non-Hispanic whites. And then um, Hispanics are about one and a half times as likely to develop um, dementia. So you really see how this is a disease that can affect people. Um, if we're looking at those disparities in terms of um, Ethnic, ethnically diverse communities. It really does make a difference. And that's one of the things that we're trying to encourage people for more research to be part, to participate more so we can figure out why. Why are these numbers the way they are? 
Why are African Americans more affected? Why, um, what is it? Is it lifestyle? Is it genetics? What are these things? And this is all the stuff that we're still trying to figure out with Alzheimer's disease. So Monica, again, we did have one question about oh, yes. someone asking about vascular dementia that usually happens after a stroke. Mm -hmm. So um, will you touch on that later on in this uh, presentation or? Yeah, absolutely. And vascular dementia, actually, I'll, I'll touch on it very briefly right now, and then I'll also touch on it um, throughout. But um, it is vascular dementia is dementia caused by a stroke or a series of strokes. So it could be the small TIAs that someone isn't aware of. Um, and so lots of the stuff that we'll talk about later in the presentation will really relate to um, your risk reduction. Um, and so your risk reduction of having a stroke. Um, and again, these sometimes these are such small strokes that they aren't even noticed. Um, and that's, it's a buildup over time. So I'll get to that. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about vascular dementia um, throughout um, later in the presentation. So when we're looking at the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, obviously I mentioned age earlier, we've mentioned genetic, or we've mentioned gender, and then also next is genetics. Um, so obviously everybody here, we get copies of genes from our parents. And so if you have someone in your family who has, who had Alzheimer's or another form of dementia, yeah, you're going to be at a little bit greater risk of developing Alzheimer's as, than someone who doesn't. But it's the same as if you have like curly hair. Well, most likely someone in your family also had curly hair. You know, we just think of that, those basic genetics of what is passed down. So it's not that it is a slam dunk. It's not guaranteed. Um, it's just a greater chance. Um, so persons with a family history are at about one and a half times greater risk of someone who doesn't. Um, the one area of research that they're looking at in terms of genetics is this APOE4 gene. So this is the gene that you might hear about when someone will talk about the Alzheimer's gene, you know, through 23andMe or those Ancestry.com um, genetic tests that you can do. Um, this, they will test for this. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, not, uh, it's not predictive. Um, so if you have, you get two of these genes, you each, everyone has an APOE something, either two, three, or four. You have two of them, one from mom, one from dad. And if you have two of the E4 genes, you're at an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, so you're at an increased risk, but you're not, it's not predictive. It doesn't mean you are going to. So we say that sometimes these genetic tests, they can give people either false hope or they can scare people in a way that isn't necessary um, because you could have two of these genes, think you're at a great risk and never go on to develop this disease. So it's not predictive. Um, and so they're still doing some research about that. Other medical conditions, and um, you know, these could affect uh, your risk for Alzheimer's, as we mentioned earlier, depression, uh, diabetes, uh, increased cholesterol in midlife, and traumatic brain injury. And I'll talk about all of these a um, more in depth. Ah, ah, goodness. Okay, so here we are. Now let's get into the bulk of this world of living a brain healthy lifestyle. Okay, what do we want to do? How do we want to do this? Why should we do this? And is any of this gonna do any good, right? So the one thing that was um, a big research study that came out um, a few years ago was this Lancet De Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention, and Cure and Care. So it was looking at how can we really reduce our risk of developing Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. And they looked at a few different factors and they came down to these nine different um, risk factors. First of all, your years of education before the age of 15, really saying the importance of um, early education and also continued education. This is um, something that they saw as much more of a um, concern in more rural communities, uh, rural countries and rural populations where um, schooling isn't guaranteed past the age of 15. Um, they looked at, this study looked at hypertension, obesity, and hearing loss in midlife. Um, in late life, they looked at smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation, and diabetes. 
And by controlling all of these risk factors, they are able to cut dementia risk by 35%. So if you, I, I really look at this as saying, if you have any of these conditions, hypertension, if you're overweight, um, hearing loss, smoking, depressions, all of these things, get them taken care of. Um, it doesn't mean if you experience hearing loss in midlife that you're going to go on to develop Alzheimer's. But if you take care of it, if you get hearing aids, if you're able to help yourself, be a, help your brain as well, because there is the connection between the hearing and the brain and seeing how you can help control this by and this would help with reducing your dementia risk. Um, and we'll talk about this more in all these different categories uh, throughout this presentation. I think especially if we're looking at right now in terms of what our current world is and all of the, um, as I like to call it physical distancing, not social distancing, because we can't socially distance. We need to physically distance right now. Um, so the big concern obviously is that social isolation piece, which is why I know Zoom isn't ideal. It's not great, but you know what? It's better than nothing. And it gives us this great chance to be able to see people. It's like, oh my gosh, look, there's, there's Ishara. It's so nice to see her. And um, you're able to connect in those ways. Um, and especially looking right now with our current society is trying to keep this in mind and try and find ways to still be physically active because it really matters for your cognitive health. Um, and so trying to not be socially isolated. So the FINGER study, I'm going to talk a bit about some of these are lifestyle intervention studies that have, um, the, the FINGER study for, um, is one of the first ones, um, started in Finland. So it's the Finnish geriatric intervention to study, um, study prevention, cognitive impairment and disability. Um, so they cut that down to the word FINGER. Um, and it was a two year study focusing on several lifestyle factors and a variety of different risk factors. Um, again, looking at physical dietary guidance, what are we eating? What are people eating? Um, physical activity, uh, cognitive training and social activities. And that doesn't just mean crossword puzzles. Everyone always thinks it's crossword puzzles. It's not crossword puzzles. Um, it's, it's a greater scope of cognitive training. Um, and then also really monitoring and managing metabolic and vascular risk factors. Um, one of the things that researchers are looking at especially is um, the world of um, blood pressure. And by controlling that for a longer period of time, really making sure that it's flat and even and not with the spikes in the valleys that happen so often with blood pressure, um, by uh, managing it as long as you can and being very um, aggressive in that management to keep the numbers down. And if it meets medication, that's fine. The medication are there to be able to help. Um, so it's not just a matter of like, oh, I, I have high blood pressure and so I'm going to develop cognitive decline. It's controlling that high blood pressure, controlling your diabetes, controlling these things, keeping the numbers down um, and they showed that significant benefit was shown um, on overall cognitive performance testing for people who were following, who are a part of this study. So this study really was groundbreaking in that world of saying, we actually can do something about Alzheimer's and dementia. It's not just, well, you're, you're old. This is what you're going to have to deal with. We really, there is hope and we can do something about it. So off of this study came the uh, U.S. pointer study. So this is a, the United States version of the finger study. Um, and again, looking at supporting brain health and preventing cognitive decline. Uh, this is sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association. Um, there is, um, for some reason, I don't understand why Los Angeles doesn't get picked to be um, sites for some of these studies, because we are huge and there's so many people here. Um, but LA is not a site for this study. Um, but across the country, again, another two-year trial targeting older adults who are at risk and looking at these same different intervention methods. So the one thing this, this U.S. pointer study, um, again, looking at physical exercise, nutritional counseling, modification, all of these things, um, 
this is a part of a larger worldwide study that has now come about called the Worldwide Finger Study. So off of the finger study from the previous slide. It is in the United States, it's in Europe, and it's in Australia. Um, one of the real focuses of this is to find sustainable strategies for um, populations that do have different geographical, economic, and cultural settings. We can't put American standards um, on people who are in rural India. You know, those are very different. The access is different. So how can we really have this information be something that is translatable to people of different cultures? So this Worldwide Fingers study, um, you can Google it, um, and it's literally www fingers. Um, and it talks about what they are doing to try to make this inf information about lifestyle intervention really be applicable to people across the globe. So as we have mentioned, or as I've mentioned, obviously cardiovascular conditions increase your risk for Alzheimer's. Um, by lowering and controlling for these, it really cuts your risk for Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. And it is an area to be focused on and to um, really do your best to take care of these things. I think ultimately we are, Americans are, I think lots of humans in general are, we are lazy people. We like sitting down and we want to be able to, I'll oh, just take a pill to make that better. Well, this isn't going to, there isn't a pill that's just gonna make this all better. This is something that we all need to work at and we need to focus on. And we need to make this be an effort on our part. Um, it's not something that's gonna to happen tomorrow, but gradual steps over time will make a difference and it will help your overall cognitive health. So we're thinking about diet here, um, the Mediterranean diet. I'm sure majority of you have probably heard of the Mediterranean diet. Um, I don't know, does anybody follow the Mediterranean diet? Nodding, head shaking. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see a thumbs up there. Okay, that's always good. Um, and I say, follow most of it. And you don't have to follow all of it. None of this is 100%. This could easily be 80%. This could easily be 60%. Because 60% of following a Mediterranean diet is way better than not. So when we're thinking about a Mediterranean diet, this is where lots of research has really gone into showing the benefits of it due to the overall health of it, the freshness of the food, and the vitamins and the nutrients that come in the food. So you're looking at fish, um, and we want good uh, fatty fish. We want fish that are full of omega-3 fatty acids. So like thinking about salmon, mackerel, sardines, um, some things that aren't necessarily top of the list, um, but they are really good for you. Um, they have, again, that good heart, uh, the good fat, the heart healthy fat. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about fish consumption in the next few slides. Um, one thing I always get the question though, whenever I'm talking about this is people will say, well, I don't like fish. I'm like, well, then don't, don't eat it. Like, don't force yourself on it. It's not going to make that big of a difference in your life. Um, or people who just, um, say maybe they're allergic to fish or they don't like it. Well, then don't eat it. Like if, if any of these things don't fit with your life, like don't do it. People are like, I'm allergic to nuts. It's like, well, then don't eat the nuts. It's pretty simple there. Um, but I think people feel that if they're going to adhere to a diet, it has to be all or nothing. I think that's what we've been told a lot is that if you're going to do a diet, it's all or nothing. Well, that's not true. And if you want to have a piece of chocolate cake on your birthday um, or on Saturday, that's fine. Have a piece of chocolate cake while you're on the Mediterranean diet. Just don't have two. And don't have one Saturday and then Sunday and then Monday and then Tuesday. So we try to incorporate this healthy lifestyle. Um, we're definitely looking at, in this Mediterranean diet, uh, fish and vegetables, or, or fruits and vegetables, um, looking at fruit that's high in antioxidants, especially. We want, um, again, good irons, good proteins. Um, you think about the antioxidants, the green leafy vegetables, the spinach, the cruciferous vegetables, um, fruits, berries, um, anything like that. Again, you're looking at trying to, as we say, like eat a rainbow. 
So make sure your plate is pretty. Like don't have a beige plate. Like beige plates aren't good for anybody, not even two-year-olds. You know, everyone's like, oh, you know, my kid just likes chicken nuggets. It's like, well, that's nice, but like, let's get some color in there. So for all of us, none of us are two. None of us, you know, we should not be eating chicken nuggets um, that, in, are, that are in the shapes of dinosaurs or anything like that. We should be having pretty plates with good food, good color, which means good nutrition. Um, looking at olive oils. I know there's lots of different types of oils out there right now avocado oil and coconut oil and sunflower oil and grapeseed oil. If you, if you ever go to Whole Foods and you look down that, like the um, olive oil uh, or the oil aisle, it could be pretty overwhelming. It's like, what do I get? Well, first of all, we're looking at a few different factors. One, cost. And some of these other oils are really, really expensive. And are you going to get that much of a benefit off of some of these other oils? You know, we're not seeing, like, in terms of cognitive health, we're not seeing a true, um, it doesn't matter if it's an avocado oil, a coconut oil, or a good olive oil. Again, we want to stay away from some of the, the um, more processed oils. Like, you want to stay away from, let's stay away from the canola. Okay, let's try to get, like, find some better oils, especially like the olive oils. Those are really good heart healthy. Um, rich in omega-3s as well. Um, nuts, something that's highly overrated or um, I think underutilized in our society um, is the benefits of nuts um, and also same with beans. Um, and with the Mediterranean diet it is also red wine is available in moderation. Um, so as we say, it's red wine, it's not white wine. And we say it's a glass, not a glass. So, you know, you can get some of those glasses that practically a whole wine bottle can fit in one glass of wine. That's not, the, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an actual red wine in moderation, appropriate for your age, your condition, obviously talk to your doctor, all of that. But just in terms of, we're looking at this general overall health that is associated with the Mediterranean diet. So um, as research has shown that the Mediterranean diet actually does lower a risk of having a stroke. Um, so if we look here at this slide, um, people on the left had the low adherence to the Mediterranean di diet and had the higher incident of a stroke um, relative um, infarct risk. So we are looking at people who have um, who adhere to the diet. Um, even again, you look at the moderate, you see that difference in cutting down your risk of a stroke. Um, I, don't, I personally don't believe in the 100% of anything. I believe it's sort of more of that 80-20. Um, and so, because sometimes that 20% is, you know, those things that you enjoy um, and it gives you some of the pleasure. So, you know, just looking at the Mediterranean diet, trying to find a way to be able to um, incorporate that into your life, even if it's just bits and pieces of it slowly over time. So this is an area um, we call pseudomedicine. So pseudomedicine, we're looking at supplements. Um, this came about from, there's so many different items on shelves now if you go and it talks about, um, oh, this will help support brain health and this will help give you, you know, cognitive benefits, and this can help reduce your risk of dementia, and this, you know, you go and you hear all that stuff, especially if you watch any daytime television, you're going to see advertisements for things like this. Um, if you go to the store, you're going to hear things like this. So we're looking, but lots of these, they really don't have any evidence. There's really no scientific evidence that supports these claims. So it's this world of what we call pseudo-medicine, sort of like fake medicine. Um, some of these medication or the supplements that are um, available, th what they do for the cognitive benefit is no more than what a cup of coffee could do for you. You know, people have that cup of coffee, it sort of like wakes them up in the morning and it uh, gives them that little boost. And so the pseudo medicine is no greater than that. And, but people are putting lots of money into it and uh, really trying to make this a business. So in last Jan or January of 2019, the FDA issued 12 warning letters and five advisory letters to companies that were marketing um, supplements that claim to prevent 
to claim to prevent, treat, or cure Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this doesn't exist. Um, you could take you know, as much vitamin E as you want and you still may have developed dementia. Um, yes, incorporating these vitamins and supplements into your body can be good for you, but not to the point of hoping for it to be a cure. So obviously if we all had a personal, if we all had a personal nutritionist sitting by our side and telling us what we should and should not eat based upon our own blood and metabolism, of course we all would do better, right? But this isn't something that we should be focusing on in terms of giving lots of money to these areas, buying lots of supplements, because um, the credibility is just lacking. And, um, so we want to make sure that people are aware of it. If it sounds too good to be true, there's a really good chance that it is. And be smart about it. If you have questions about something, feel free to do your research. You know, the Alzheimer's Association really has great information on um, different types of supplements and um, really gives some good information regarding what we could do. You know, there's areas in terms of supplements of um, where there's some research like curcumin, which is an ingredient in curry, um, really a very strong antioxidant. And that's lots of studies are being done on that right now. Um, also antioxidants, as I mentioned, um, let's say pomegranates. I know Dr. Gary Small at UCLA did a study um, on, with pomegranate juice and cognition. Um, there's, there was a study years ago about vitamin E, people taking large doses of vitamin E and hoping that that could push off Alzheimer's or dementia. None of these have really shown to be able to prevent, cure, or treat Alzheimer's. They could be good for general brain health. Um, but it's, I always just like to have this slide up here, just sort of as that public service announcement of the warning that lots of people, they, they take advantage of all of our, our desperation and our hunger to be able to find a cure for this. So when we're thinking about cognitive and social activity, uh, you know, think about the um, ERRC and what you do, what this organization does to be able to keep all of the members, you know, cognitively and socially engaged um, as we say with COVID, you know, again, I, every time I hear the word of socially distant, I don't like that. It's like, as I said, it's physically distant. We, you know, keep our space, but still be social, still see each other. Um, because cognitively inactive people over the age of 65 are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And so we need to keep in being engaged with each other, whether that means book clubs via Zooms, get togethers in a park where you're distant, um, having people over in your backyard, if there's space with chairs, you can still do those things. Um, it's good for your brain and you need to be able to still be engaged. Um, lots of the research has really seen that it's like the social network size, the size of the group of people that you, it, that you associate with um, can actually help with your brain health. So if you have a larger social network, you're going to have a decreased risk of developing dementia. Um, and for lots of different reasons, right? If you rely upon one person, well, what if that one person goes on vacation or that one person's sick or that one person, you know, well, then all of a sudden your social network is gone. You know, the larger a social network you have, the more people you have to co connect with and to talk to. Um, and I always, with this world of social and um, cognitive activity people are like okay so it's crossword puzzles and it's reading and it's no it's doing what you enjoy like i no matter how much i try i'm not a big reader like i try and i try and i i'm just not a big reader but i like doing other things i love being in the garden i love um you know doing things in the kitchen I find these different ways to keep myself cognitively engaged and to be able to get, bring myself joy. And research has shown, there was a research study a few years ago talking about if people are doing um, activities, pleasurable physical activities, so where you're actually getting up and you're moving around, that the benefit there was just as great as it was for people who were doing focused exercise. Mm -hmm. So if you're working, or I like to say playing in the garden um, for an hour, 
that will give you just as much cognitive benefit as if you went to the gym for an hour. Because you're looking at, you're giving yourself pleasure. I don't know if the gym's always pleasurable. You know, sometimes it is, sometimes it's just a slog just to be able to get through that time. So you want to find what gives you pleasure and what, be, what also helps you cognitively and socially and physically. So this big word of exercise. My, I prefer to, to remove the word exercise and just add the word movement. You know, we are a sedentary life. We, people are, live sedentary lifestyles. I think now with the world of COVID restrictions, people are even more sedentary because they're in their home all the time or they don't wanna get out. Um, so obviously this slide is from a while ago, but I think that it still relates to the fact that we all know we should exercise. I don't think this is something new that I'm telling anybody here. If so, you've been living under a rock for the, you know, the past number of years. We all know we need to exercise and we need to move, that it's good for our bodies. And what's good for your body is good for your brain. Um, people think about heart disease, thinking about stroke, thinking about diabetes. One of the greatest ways to control for these is movement and exercise. So try when looking at this slide and we're looking at 26% of people who do get the recommended amount of exercise each week, try to make sure that you're in that 26% and let's bump that up a little bit. So um, that people do get, um, that you do get exercise and that you do get up and move. Um, this study I find absolutely fascinating. So if you want to, so pay attention here. Okay, so this is... Um, a study that was released in um, 20, 2011. So, um, you know, coming up on 10 years old, but still when we're looking at research studies, it's not that old. Um, it shows that exercise is associated with increased brain volume and improved memory. So in our brains, we have um, what's called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is the part of your brain that is responsible for um, short-term memories and forming and having short-term memories become long-term memories. So it is crucial in the world of um, memories, re memory retention. And it's also the first place where um, researchers and clinicians will see atrophy with um, someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. It's in the hippocampus. It's the first place of the brain where they start to notice the plaques and the tangles that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So this study, had um, people over the age of 65. Um, at the beginning of the study, they um, did um, uh, MRIs on everyone, measured their hippocampus to see how big it is. That's called hippocampal volume. Um, and then they divided these people into two different groups. One group was a group of people who did stretching exercises. And then another group did exercise, did cardiovascular exercise. And um, at six months, they measured their MRI, they um, did another MRI to measure their hippocampus. And then at one year, they did as well. The people who were in the, um, the, card, the um, physical exercise group, the cardiovascular exercise group, actually saw a growth in their hippocampus. So by doing that cardiovascular exercise, the aerobic exercise, they were actually able to grow part of their brain as opposed to the people who were in the stretching group. Their hippocampus did not grow. So you see that in the world of, it's important to move. You're getting more oxygen rich blood to your brain. You're getting the heart rate up. You're getting the heart to work a little bit more. You're circulating um, the blood throughout your brain, throughout your body. So by getting up and moving, um, if you have physical limitations that prevent you to actually say go for a walk, there are still exercises you can do in chairs, chair yoga, chair exercise, weightlifting, finding ways to get that heart rate up a bit, even with regardless of the limitations that you may have physically. And if you don't have limitations physically, then all you need to do, and I say this and everyone's going to say, oh, all you need to do, but walk a little bit more, five minutes. And then maybe you make that 10 minutes. And then maybe you make that 15 minutes. Don't say, I'm gonna go for a mile walk today. Well, what if you haven't walked a mile in a long time? 
you're going to fail, you're not going to like it, you're going to be discouraged, and then you're not going to do it again. So finding those small ways, I'm going to go for a walk around the block. And then the next day, I'm going to go for two walks around the block. Again, not asking you to do anything major. I'm not asking you to go and to sign up for any runs or take any exercise classes. It's just in improve the increasing the amount of movement that you do in a day that will help your brain. Um, my boss at the Easton Center, um, Dr. Sarah Kremen, she sees people, um, gives them diagnosis of Alzheimer's, dementia, um, and they'll often say, it's like, okay, well, what can we do? Okay, so we've been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, um, Alzheimer's disease, and she will say one of the best things you could do is just start moving. Even once you have been diagnosed, is by maintaining movement can help slow down the progression of disease. Um, it, like I said earlier, just kick the can down the road a little bit. So after this, I want everyone to get up and to go for a walk, even if it's inside your house. The other day, the smoke was really bad and I was not going outside. So I walked around my house for about 10 minutes. Um, I think my cats were looking at me like, what are you doing? Um, but just because I felt like I was sitting so much, I just needed to move. So that is everyone's homework assignment after this presentation. Um, the next thing that um, there has been a lot more research about lately is sleep and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, sleep is very important for people. Um, it's your body's chance to reset from the day before, um, from all the damage that has been done either by the food that we've eaten or the air that we've breathed or just had a greater environmental aspect of it. Um, and a study that came out a few years ago, and I apologize, I keep forgetting to cite this source on this slide, um, is out of Wheaton College where it talked about connections between breathing disorders, so such as like sleep apnea, um, that interrupts sleep and the accumulation of biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So when we talk about biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, there's two. And it's, excuse me, um, the amyloid plaques, and neurofibrillary tangles. These are the two main um, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And so, oh, excuse me again. Okay, those with sleep disorders had a greater increase in their levels of their beta amyloid plaques uh, deposits over a three year period. Because when you sleep, it is a time when your body clears out all of these toxins. And it happens most often during your REM sleep, when you're getting that good, deep sleep. This is the time when your body really clears out these toxins from the day before and the accumulation. We all have these plaques in our brains. Um, this, that is normal. It's this increased amount of it that is not normal. So there's a problem with the way that the body is able to clear it out. Um, and they've made an association of people who have sleep disorders with an increased risk of developing um, dementia of some sort over time because the body isn't able to clear these plaques out and they just build up and increase over this time frame. So this was one of the first studies to really look at sleep apnea and the biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot more research that is going into this area. I think it's really great and really exciting. Um, and it's also something that will benefit people in general. You know, I know lots of people who try to, you know, I talked to my sister-in-law the other day and I said, well, what time do you go to bed at night? And she's like, oh, you know, 12 or one. And I looked at her, I was like, why? Um, and she said, well, sometimes I'm just watching TV. And I said, well, you know, you need to get better sleep because she was just complaining about how tired she was. Said, you know, if you are able to, I understand lots of people have different things in their lives. If you're a caregiver, obviously your sleep is interrupted. Um, but if you are able to really focus on your sleep, set a reasonable bedtime and a reasonable wake up time, it will help benefit you in general um, over a longer period of time, as well as be good for your brain. It really does help reset it. If you think about a time when you haven't slept and how good you feel when you really get a good night's sleep, and it is good for your brain and can help with pushing off um, reducing your risk of developing Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, earlier at the very beginning, we talked about hearing loss and Alzheimer's disease. Um, this was a study that came out of the University of Wisconsin. 
um, participants who report the diagnosis of hearing loss scored worse on cognitive tests, uh, which makes sense. If you can't hear it, you're, it's not being stored, you're not absorbing it, you're not using your brain in the same way, and then you're not going to be able to put it back out there. Um, so it, it's just, it's a very, it, when you really think about it in a simple way, it makes perfect sense why somebody with hearing loss may be at an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's or dementia. They're not using their brain in the same way. It may deepen an isolation that people experience. Um, it'll limit social activities because, oh, I'm just not gonna go, I can't hear. Um, and also it limits that engagement and say that cognitive intellectual engagement that is so important. And it can also accelerate someone's cognitive decline because you know it's that use it or lose it. Right? You have to use your brain to be able to maintain brain health over a longer period of time. Um, again, still looking at areas of research in, in this regard, at this true connection between hearing loss and Alzheimer's. Um, it hasn't completely been determined, but it is something that is important for people to think about, to be able to focus on. And if you have problems with your hearing, don't be stubborn. Go and talk to a doctor and try to get a hearing aid or something that can help. Um, I know my dad is number one on this list in terms of poor hearing and he's like, oh no, those hearing aids aren't any good. Well, he's never tried one. He's just going anecdotally off of what other people have told him. So do something that will help, that will benefit yourself um, and go get your hearing evaluated if you feel that there is something or if people tell you that there's a problem. Or if you notice that you do, huh? Huh? If you say that more, just think about that. Think about in your life, you, you know, you may not think you have a, any hearing problems or hearing loss, but the more you might say, huh? What was that? <laughs> Could be a sign that you really do and that there is some sort of a problem regarding your hearing. Um, again, we're trying to maintain our brains as long as we can. We're trying to maintain the health of our brains and our cognitive health. So, here are sort of my points for you for how to keep a healthy brain, okay? You can stop aging, so you can decide to stop doing that. You can go back in time, you can choose the right parents. You can find parents who have lived to be over 100 years old and with no cognitive decline. Um, but unfortunately, we don't know how to do those two, top two things. So we can look at what's practical. Um, eating a healthy diet. Um, med, med, if you want to subscribe to like a Mediterranean diet, um, again, looking at controlling fats, um, eating heart healthy fats, um, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, keeping your mind active. Programs such as this, other programs that I know that the, that the center really focuses on and provides. I've received your newsletter and there's always so many things that are in there to try to help really benefit your life, benefit um, all of your retirement time and not just have this be like, oh, I'm gonna sit around now. Like be active, do what you can, get your regular exercise. Um, if you ride a bike, if you do anything like that, please be smart, wear a helmet. Um, always just be mindful of the surroundings around you to be able to minimize um, brain injury. And to, um, also whenever you think about that, like if you're thinking about what, if you walk, Check, notice your gait. See if your gait is a little unsteady. Um, pay attention to these types of things that could, um, to reduce your risk of being hurt, of a fall, where you could end up hitting your head and having more of um, some long-term problems cognitively. Uh, this is my information. Um, there's my phone number, but I tell everyone, don't call me on it right now because I'm not actually in the office. Um, so my email is the best way to reach me right now if anyone has any questions or if you want any other information, um, then underneath that is our website. So um, if you have um, anything, if you think about any questions later or down the road or want other information, please, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to be a resource to our UCLA community. Um, and I want to open it up for questions. Um, obviously, if anyone has questions, Aisha, do you prefer if people chat, put it in the chat box, or if they just unmute themselves? Do you have a preference? I think we can unmute. Um, I did add some information into the chat room about um, I host um, a bi-monthly support group for retired faculty who are dealing with loved ones that have a cognitive decline. So you can email me privately if you want more information on that. 
Um, I listed your information. Um, also the Alzheimer's Association website. Um, recently I did a podcast about older adults and well-being. So that link is in there. So there's lots of good links in the chat, but feel free if you have questions that haven't been addressed yet. Um, anyone can unmute themselves and ask a question. And just off of what Aisha just mentioned in terms of like, <laughs> I want to give hands to the speaker and thank you so much. I have to time out. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you spending your morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we also do, um, as Aisha was mentioning, I know um, that your center has the support groups, but we also have lots of different support groups as well uh, for caregivers of people with um, Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. So that is an option for you. Um, it's, I say sometimes it's a matter of days and times, mm -hmm. right? What works for somebody in the schedule? So if the one that Aisha runs doesn't fit your schedule, we have some as well that um, are, we'd love to be able to help and support you in any way that you can, especially when it comes to caring for someone who does have um, some form of memory loss. And it's, it's very challenging. Uh, I will say before I came to UCLA, I was at the Alzheimer's Association for many years. And a lot of the issues you would have from clients would be just the loved one dealing with the reality of their loved one having Alzheimer's. Like, oh, mom had a good day. It doesn't mean that they don't still have Alzheimer's. You know, they, everyone has good days and bad days. Um, and it's also a great resource center. Um, if you're near USC, they have a family caregiver, family caregiver support center as well. So there are definitely resources out there. Um, if you don't know where to turn to, please email me or Monica and we could, we, if, like she said, if we don't know the answer, we'll make it up or we'll find <laughs> the person that can help you. And, and I'm actually just gonna stop sharing my screen just so we can go back to the larger, um, the larger screen so people can see each other. I always think that that is good or, or those of us who are, who are on video um, to be able to share our screens, to be able to um, have a chance to communicate and talk if anyone wants to. Usually when I do this, like I said, it's the engagement during the presentation. So I always want to um, answer any questions. I do see one message in the chat that someone said that I thought that canola oil was good for you. You know, when we're thinking about oils, what you really want to watch is the fat and the type of fat. So when, if you're looking at the best oil, truly research has shown it comes down to olive oil is probably one of your best. That's more affordable. Okay. Yes, you can go to Whole Foods and you can get like the bottle that's this big, four ounces of avocado oil that's going to run you thirty dollars. Okay, like, is, is the benefit from that going to be, you know, that great? Not necessarily. So we want to find ways that meet your lifestyle, meet your financial um, um, situation, as well as something that will truly be beneficial. So yes, a canola oil it's fine. Is it what you should use on everything? No. So that's, I always, it's that world of the moderation and having an idea of it. It's better, it's definitely better than Crisco. So, you know, we think, think about that world of it and also seeing some of the things like the, the world of the fats and how years ago, you know, no one would ever eat an avocado because it was high in fat. But now avocados are now, they're high in good fat. So it's like, oh, there's a difference. So being paying attention to that, that is really what we want to focus on. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Hi. Sure. Hi. Um, I was the one who asked about the vascular. Now, my mm -hmm. mother didn't, um, it wasn't after the fact. I mean, it wasn't an autopsy or anything. It was just while she was alive, that's what they decided that she had a, a mild form of. Um, and they never talked about any strokes or anything, mm -hmm. which is maybe neither here nor there, maybe she did have a stroke, but it was never evident that she did. So I was just curious about how much of that is possibly genetic. I mean, I worry about myself, obviously. Of course. So actually, it, and, um, you mentioned that, and I realized that was one thing that I didn't talk that much on, um, is that true world of genetics. So if you if I'm just humor me for a few minutes here. So when we're thinking about this world of genetics and Alzheimer's disease, and I'm just going to say Alzheimer's, I'm going to say it's the general world of, let's say dementia, okay? Um, that there in all, we think about all of the cases of what we call late onset dementia. So that's dementia over the age of 65 or, um, is it's about 1% of the, 
of all cases of late onset dementia are truly genetic, where there could be a true genetic link that is found. So it's very, very small. For people who are under the age of 65, there is a greater risk of that of, um, and I don't know that number completely off the top of my head, and I apologize for that, but the, um, that genetic link is greater. But, so if we're thinking about the older onset, it's much more sporadic. Yes, there are markers, there are some different genes. There's presenilin one, two, there's this APOE4, there's all of these things that could be, in fact, a genetic, genetic <coughs> one. But for looking at where the true genetic link comes, it is often in the young onset. Like there is, um, in Jalisco, Mexico, there is a, a center of a group of um, a population of people who develop young onset and mm -hmm. it is like it's a 50 50 chance like if the parent has the gene if they pass on that gene the child will develop alzheimer's disease and these are people developing it in their like, 30s and 40s so and it's really fast moving um yeah. so um there is a 60 minutes um documentary of maybe about a year ago something like that um that talked about this so if you're very if you're interested it's just fascinating to you i know, think i remember that yeah 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 and there's been a few different documentaries um you know tv yeah. shows that talk about the true genetic links um i know in terms of frontal temporal dementia there are some um again genetic links um where it's, um, but these are very very rare cases mm -hmm. so i say like my grandmother had alzheimer's that's why you know this is why i'm in this field and so that means that my mom, you know, has a greater risk. But it's also like, well, none of her, like she has siblings who are much older than her. Not that they haven't developed any memory yeah. loss um, besides maybe just general age related in terms of not hearing what she said, not recalling what she said, but not where it's a true dementia. So, yeah, I mean, my mother wasn't even, they told her it wasn't even until the late 80s, early 90s oh. that it happened. So. Yeah, yeah. And anything at that point, I think really your area of concern is going to be it's when people are younger. Because yeah. um, also when we're looking at like this over of this arch of dementia is that it actually starts to affect the brain way before symptoms even begin. Way before you, you're ever even, you know. So if someone starts developing symptoms, let's say in their 50s, that means that let's say these plaques and these tangles have started to build while they're in their 30s and 40s mm. so but if someone develops dementia in their 80s and the first symptoms are shown in their 80s then it might be in the 60s and 70s when this so we see yeah. this difference in terms of let's say what would be more an aggressive form um, of dementia um, mm. and again dementia as that umbrella term sure that word. thank you mm -hmm. on the hearing thing um have there been if they check to see if getting hearing aids improves or reduces the chance of dementia, you know, they know that hearing loss increases it. Yeah, definitely getting hearing aids does help reduce your risk. That's what we're looking at is risk, risk reduction. So it definitely mm -hmm. does help reduce your risk um, because now you're able, you're able to hear again. Um, and it also helps with the brain stimulation a little bit because that's part okay, of the problem. Right. The sound isn't even coming in, then your, your brain's not being stimulated in the same way. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So the prevailing idea is that they do work. Yeah. I guess. They're better I, than not. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah, because it's like no, everyone who I know who has hearing aids, and I don't, so I can't you know, speak from a firsthand experience. Everyone's always like, eh, you know, eh, they're, they're not great but they're better than nothing. Uh -huh. So, but in terms of cognitive benefit, and we're thinking about just in that regard, that they are, it is important to be able to get them to be able to help improve that. Maybe, uh, maybe they'll get better. Maybe they're getting better all the time. I mean, I assume they're getting better all the time. I would hope so. It's yeah. just basic technology, right? Yeah. It's just basic right. advancements in science and technology. You hope that right. hearing aids are gonna get better. <laughs> At least they're smaller now. They're not, they're not the big massive that they once were, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Grandma, I want 
I think that, <laughs> um, I don't see anything else. There's a chat. question in the chat about if you did a distinction between Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah, so all I think, si yeah. I'll, I'll just give the very brief, my brief on that is that Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. Yeah. So Alzheimer's disease, if you think about the world of, let's say, cancer, cancer, there's lots of different types. There's dementia, and there's a lot of different types. It's yeah. that umbrella world. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. Yeah, that was always um, the common misconception when I was at Alzheimer's is people just use it interchangeably, but um, yeah. dementia is the overall type of disease, just like you said, cancer, and then there's mm -hmm. different types of that, so. And then what, what, one thing that I'm always very, um, what, you know, we all have our own little messages that we always wanna push through, is that my, is if anyone is ever just diagnosed with, oh, dementia, push for a better diagnosis. Because let's say you were diagnosed with pain. Someone diagnosed you with pain. What would your next question be? Well, like what kind? Why? What is it? Is it rheumatoid arthritis? Is it a broken arm? Like what's the difference? Like my wrist hurts. So is it broken or is it arthritis? So it's the same thing. Like you shouldn't just be diagnosed with dementia because that's not a diagnosis. It's a description of a group of symptoms. So it would be the same way as if you were diagnosed with pain. Your question should be what kind? And they vary wildly. Some of the people that I worked with at Alzheimer's, you know, if they had frontotemporal, there's that personality shift. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, definitely um, talk to a neurologist. Mm -hmm. um, if you need more input, um, Angie just did another meet, uh, a question in the chat. So I don't know if you want to post. Um, yeah. Well, Angie, I'm going to send the, the slides and you'll see a great illustration of the umbrella of dementia. There's frontotemporal, there's um, vascular dementia, there's um, traumatic brain injury, there's dementia uh, with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's yeah. related dementia. Let me tell yeah. you, we could keep going on days on the different types of dementias and the difference. I am putting in our Easton Center um, information into the chat so that people can um, go onto our website. Um, if you have any specific information, um, we do have lists of different types of dementias in there and also different types of the different doctors that we have to be able to help with the different dementias, um, if it's more behavioral, if it's more you know, general. So I just entered um, our website as well as my email. So if anyone has those questions, you know, please reach out. Um, and then the other one that I will put in here as well is Alzheimer's Los Angeles. So they are a, lo a local, there's Alzheimer's Association and there's Alzheimer's Los Angeles. So those are good. Um, actually, I don't know what their website is. I know it. I never know, is it Alls LA or is it Alzheimer's? It's Alls GLA. So, no, it's not, um, no, it's not that one. It's not the GLA. They it's changed it? Yeah, they changed it. Oh, well, it's been a long time since <laughs> there. Um, crazy, okay. Oh yeah, they did. It's just Alzheimer's LA now. All right, well, I yeah. learned something. So I'll update that in the we'll chat. We'll figure that out, everybody, right? Yeah, I'm putting it in there right now. Back also, in my day, it was just <laughs> there it is. A -L -D -G -L -A. And also be mindful, as you could tell, it's like, you don't need to remember everything. I think people put lots of pressure on their on themselves. Of like, oh, why don't I remember this? Oh, why can't I remember this? You don't need to remember everything. I can remember that's, a thing. That's why we have computers. <laughs> That's why we have these magical devices, okay? Yeah. They, they like, you know, they help us remember, so it's fine. <laughs> well, I'm going to um, stop recording. Yeah. And as I said, I'll be sending out the presentation. Thank you all for attending this morning. Hopefully you have a great Monday. Don't watch too much of the news. Um, <laughs> get up for a walk, go for yeah. a walk. Get a good, yeah. get, get some nuts for a snack. Get a good brain healthy snack here. And we'll see Thanks. you soon, okay? Great.